Hey guys, so today we are continuing the History, Flaws, and Cancelled series and looking at the infamous Chrysler PT Cruiser. If you're new to these types of videos, the first part focuses on looking back at the history of the car and all the details and specs, and then we jump to talking about the events that led to the car being cancelled and any flaws that it had. The Chrysler PT Cruiser lived through 10 model years from 2001 to 2010, including a 5-door hatchback version and a 2-door convertible from 2005 to 2008. So throughout the video, you'll be seeing footage of a mix of the various years. I do want to mention that while there are many special editions of the PT Cruiser over its life, like the Dream Cruiser series, Sunset Boulevard, or Pacific Coast Highway Edition, just to name a few, I've tried not to include those in this video because I do plan on doing an entire separate video on rare and limited edition PT Cruisers. So let's begin way back in 1997. The PT Cruiser was designed before Chrysler merged with Daimler-Benz in 1997. Chrysler was originally planning a new look for Plymouth, so they took some cues from the future Plymouth Prowler to make the 1997 Plymouth Pronto Spider concept car and the 1999 Plymouth Pronto Cruiser concepts. Daimler-Chrysler would eventually discontinue the Plymouth brand, so the PT Cruiser evolved into the Chrysler model that we all know today. When the PT Cruiser released in 2000 for the 2001 model year, there was nothing on the road quite like it. And that was a big part of its success and fun, as people either loved it or hated it, and they had arguments over exactly what it was. Was this a hot rod, a small panel van, a concept car, or a sedan? Chrysler would even say that it was too cool to categorize. Ultimately, the PT Cruiser was a front engine, front wheel drive, small family car slash compact multi-purpose vehicle that was sold internationally as an entry-level Chrysler. There was just a one generation for the 10 model years, but the car did get a facelift for the 2006 model year and up from there. The PT Cruiser was designed as a modern interpretation of the Chrysler Airflow, sharing many parts with the Dodge Neon, but using a slightly different platform. The PT name has a dual meaning, as it stands for personal transportation, as well as the car's platform name. The Neon was built on the Chrysler PL platform, or Platform Low, while the PT Chrysler is built on a modified version called the PT Platform, or Platform Tall. The official classification was interesting, as this was classified as a truck in the US by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration for fuel economy calculations, but it was deemed to be a car in all the other metrics. Chrysler did this on purpose, making sure the PT Cruiser would fit into the criteria for a light truck so they could use it to bring up the average fuel economy of all the various trucks that Chrysler was making at the time. So it really is a vehicle stuck between segments. You'll also notice pictures of the car throughout the video from various places in the world as both the convertible and the regular versions were offered in Canada, Europe, Japan, South Africa, Australia, and other countries alongside the United States. It was mostly assembled at the Toluca Car Assembly Plant in Mexico, and also for just one year in 2002 at the Eurostar Automobile Work in Graz of Austria. And in Japan, the PT Cruiser replaced the Neon as Chrysler's small car offering there. The models varied over the first generation. The first year in 2001 started with a base for $15,935 and a limited for $20,120. By the middle of the lifespan in 2005, there were seven different trim levels, base, touring, limited, and GT at the top for the regular hatchback, and then base, touring, and GT for the two-door convertible. The GT hatchback came in around $23,165, while the GT convertible was up to over $28,000. Nearing the end in 2009, there was the LX, touring, and limited models, and then in 2010, there was just one model called the Classic. The PT Cruiser lower-end models were reasonably priced throughout the lifetime, as you can see by the Adjusted for Inflation column. You guys know that I like to provide the most in-depth content that I can, so on screen now you can find slides of the various trim levels for the 2006 model year, including the standard and optional features for each. I'm not going to go over them, but they're there on screen in case you want to pause and read for yourself. Now let's talk about the exterior of this thing. It was built on the Chrysler PT platform as we've been over, similar to the one used for the Neon. It was actually quite compact, 6 inches shorter than the Neon, and 7 inches taller, almost as tall as some minivans. The height of 63 inches was a big part of the design, and important for hauling more cargo. It blends the retro body and look of the late 1930s and early 1940s American sedan with some modern styling cues as well. You can find dual beam headlights that are flush with the body, and taillights that are shaped like a teardrop. 
the turbocharged GT model was added for 2003, and that got a larger grill, air intakes, a spoiler on the liftgate, and chrome exhaust tips. You could also get a spoiler on the other models for 150 bucks. Chrysler also offered some sketchy tone-on-tone -tone flames for the side of the body from the factory starting in 2002. I really think this is a bizarre and weird option that looks very strange on these cars. The four-seat convertible model would get added in 2005, but that was designed a little bit different from the sedan. It had the two doors instead of four, appears to be shorter to the naked eye even though it's not, and it's lowered by three inches. There's also a high tail, steeper raked windshield, and different A-pillar design as well. The integrated sport bar was added for rigidity and rollover protection, and another benefit was that the bar caused the air to flow over the rear passengers, resulting in a less drafty ride for the backseat occupants. I've heard this convertible described as a custom chopped top hot rod by autoblog.com. The PT Cruiser would get a facelift for the 2006 models, with a more Chrysler-shaped horizontal grille and Chrysler logo, scalloped headlights, round fog lights, and a new body color spoiler on the liftgate that Chrysler added for more improved aerodynamic efficiency. And this look would stick around until the end of the PT Cruiser. On the inside, there were seats that had reasonable bolsters, and the leather package would offer a very nice appearance for such an entry-level car. That package would add leather seats, along with suede inserts in the doors and along the edge of the seats. The GT got sportier seats with extra padding, a leather-wrapped steering wheel with satin silver spokes, and bright pedals. I mentioned that the PT Cruiser was 63 inches high, so that means that it got theater-style seating, where the rear seats sit a bit higher up than the front. For the most part, passengers of any size could fit quite comfortably in either the front or the back. The dashboard was clean, functional, and symmetrical, with painted inserts and all the various switches found in the center panel area. The driver sees three white-faced gauges, a speedometer in the center, flanked by the tachometer and fuel and water temperature gauges. The GT had a speedometer up to 140 miles per hour, while the standard models went to 110 or 120 from 2006 and up. There was also tons of room with 120.5 cubic feet of interior volume, which was similar to the likes of the Mercedes-Benz S-Class or Lincoln Town Car, which you'd think are a lot bigger. Chrysler also claimed that the PT Cruiser could be configured in 26 different ways, since there is a 65-35 split rear bench that could fold flat, tumble forward, or be taken out. The front passenger seat also folds flat as well. If you do have the rear seats taken out, there is 64 cubic feet of cargo room, and the load floor in the back is 40 inches wide, making the car very practical for a variety of uses. Just like the exterior, the 2006 models got a refreshed interior as well. The center stack was changed to have a more modern design, visually splitting up the dashboard. All the instruments got bigger, the radio was mounted higher, and the glove box got larger. The center console was redesigned with a sliding armrest, new storage bin, coin holder, and fold-out cup holders in the rear. The standard stereo came with a CD player and a 3.5mm input jack with 6 speakers, but the optional Boston acoustic system did provide a solid upgrade. Other additions would include a Uconnect hands-free Bluetooth system for use with cell phones and cruise control. The convertible didn't have as much room and was also shorter in height with 60.6 inches of room. The interior volume was also cut by over 30%, down to 84.3 cubic feet. That meant less headroom and less hip room. But one plus for the convertible is that every model from the base to the GT got the same sports seats from the GT hatchback or sedan, so the interior was quite appealing. Moving on to performance, there were a bunch of different engines offered in the various markets. Non-US models got fairly weak versions, including a 1.6-liter Tritec engine, 2-liter Chrysler engine, and a 2.2-liter Mercedes-Benz turbo diesel engine. All of those had between 116 to 141 horsepower and 0 to 60 times of 10 seconds or slower. The standard engine for the North American market was a 2.4-liter dual overhead cam engine with 150 horsepower and 162 to 165 pound-feet of torque. And surprisingly, that lasted the entire life of the PT Cruiser, still being offered for 2010. The turbo version of the 2.4 was introduced for 2003, and that was used for the GT, which I'll talk more about in a minute. There was also a less powerful turbo version, starting in 2004, and that was optional for the touring or limited trims. So that gave you about 30 more horsepower and 45 more pound-feet of torque from the standard engine. Any PT Cruiser came with either a 4-speed automatic or a 5-speed manual transmission built by Getrag in Germany. Looking at some of the other information, front disc and rear drum brakes were standard, and the PT Cruiser weighed around 3,100 pounds. The body lean was well controlled, while there was some moderate understeer. 
One of the most surprising qualities of the car was the lack of road and tire noise, as Chrysler upped the noise, vibration, and harshness control on these cars. And 0-60 to 60 times were generally in the 8.5 second range for the American versions. Now I do want to spend a few minutes going over the PT Cruiser GT, which was the turbocharged high performance variation of the car. This was introduced in 2003, updated in 2006, and then dropped after the 2007 models. Chrysler upgraded the standard 2.4 liter engine with many improvements that you can find on screen, including different cylinder heads, large diameter of valves and seats, improved cooling, and different camshafts. The engine was also shared with the Dodge Neon SRT4, and many performance parts were compatible on both, but the version found on the GT had a different intake manifold, turbocharging plumbing, and intercooler. So, the 2003 to 2005 GT models had 215 horsepower and 245 pound feet of torque, which was a giant leap of 65 horsepower and 80 pound feet of torque from the regular 2.4 engines. The 2006 and 2007 models got an additional bump in power to 230 with the same torque. So, 0 to 60 happens in a respectable 6.8 to 6.9 seconds and the quarter mile in 15.4 to 15.5 seconds. The 06 and 07 models, with that extra 15 horsepower, were just one tenth of a second faster. Other improvements on the GT included body color front and rear fascia, with larger and lower openings, a tuned suspension with a 1 inch drop, a performance exhaust system with a large chrome tip, 17 inch chrome wheels with P205 5017 tires, 4 wheel disc brakes with ABS and traction control, larger rotors, and turbo calipers. If you chose the automatic transmission you will get auto stick, which is where you can shift on your own if you choose. The PT Cruiser had a mostly successful life, selling over 1.4 million units worldwide, including 1,050,281 in the United States alone. It made the 2001 Car and Driver 10 Best List, and also won the 2001 North American Car of the Year Award, but it was also named as the worst car of the last 20 years by Top Gear in 2013. One very interesting story comes from Japan, where the Mahama Resort Cab Company used PT Cruisers for their entire taxi cab fleet from 2002 to 2007. This service drove people to and from Tokyo Disneyland, and they wanted to use a PT Cruiser because it had a very fun and retro appearance. So that led to Japan purchasing over 10,000 of them. Of course, the PT Cruisers weren't built for taxi service, and the maintenance became too expensive, so that company retired all their cars after 2007. By 2010, Chrysler had just offered one trim level, the Classic, and then the model was discontinued. The final PT Cruiser was built on July 9th, 2010, and Chrysler said that that final copy was an American version in stone white. So there you have it, the PT Cruiser lives on in memory as an affordable, practical, compact car. They had a lot of interior volume, were fun to drive, and the GT had some really solid performance if that's what you wanted from it. People either loved them or hated them, as I've said before, and it is known as the best worst car ever. It also drew a cult-like following, with many different events such as the Cruise the Rockies, held by the Colorado PT Cruisers Club, where all the members gather in their cars on the Royal Gorge Bridge. There's also other events across the US, as well as different PT clubs that are still active in Australia, the UK, Germany, Netherlands, Italy, and Japan. The clubs are mostly made up of older folks, but still not many cars can say they've amassed this type of following. Many of the club members also have outrageous designs on their cars, with different paint jobs, murals, and flames. However, the car has been cancelled, like I've went over, so that does bring us to the next part of the video, looking at the reasoning for the cancellation, and the flaws of the PT Cruiser. I've come up with 7 different reasons, and or flaws that refer to the car, or Chrysler decision making, and decision executions. So let's look at those reasons now. Declining sales is almost always my first reason for these videos, as without sales, the car can't make profits for the company. The PT Cruiser was still selling very well in the US for 2005 and 2006, with over 130,000 units moved per year. However, after 2007, there was a massive drop off, as sales cut in half to around 50,000 for 2008, then under 18,000 in 2009, and under 10,000 for the final year, and the leftover inventory. When Chrysler had announced in late 2007 that they planned to end the production for the PT Cruiser in the near future, their executives were looking to kill off some of the slower selling models so Chrysler could return to profitability. The convertible was cancelled first after the 2008 model year, along with the Dodge Magnum, Chrysler Pacifica, and Chrysler Crossfire. Killing off the PT Cruiser was an easier decision when looking at the falling sales, so that too was gone after 2010. 
Another major reason was that the PT platform was getting outdated with an old structure and obsolete technology by the time 2010 rolled around. It was based on that PL platform, which is what the Dodge and Chrysler Neon was built on, but the PT Cruiser outlived the Neon by five model years, as the last Neons were sold in 2005. Once the platform became too old and the car was non-competitive in the segment, they had no choice but to cancel it. One factor that I consider to be important here is the styling of the PT Cruiser. A new model would have had to be fully redesigned and re-engineered, and I've heard that Chrysler executives really struggled with how to redesign the PT Cruiser and keep its unique character in retro styling. It was proving difficult to evolve that design, and if they attempted to change or modernize the look, it would have gone against what made this thing popular in the first place. Even the 2006 mild facelift didn't please the diehard PT fans, and the problem there started to present itself. How do you update and modernize a very old looking design? With so much expectations attached to this car that sold over 1.4 million units throughout its lifetime, Chrysler just found it easier to simply drop the PT Cruiser, and then they had more flexibility in creating the next replacement, which would be the Fiat 500L, by the way. The first three reasons are the most important for the cancellation, but I do have a few others that still contributed, but were definitely not the major reason for the car's downfall. One of those reasons is that this car was a novelty item. Keenan Mayo, the associate editor at Bloomberg Businessweek, wrote an obituary for the PT Cruiser, where he said, quote, It was a novelty car, and like all novelty items, the enthusiasm faded. The only people who were really buying it for much of the last decade were the rental car companies because it was cheap, end quote. Another thing I want to talk about was the PT Cruiser was likely subjected to the Daimler treatment. Daimler ultimately wanted to use the technology that Chrysler had, but they didn't really care about growing the brand or giving Mercedes any competition. The PT Cruiser was a halo car right off the bat, bringing many people into showrooms, and it immediately got 60,000 pre-orders before the car was released. But Daimler didn't care about Chrysler having such a successful car, and they never bothered to create any major changes for the vehicle, except that small 2006 exterior and interior refresh. Daimler had the habit of releasing Chrysler vehicles with all the bells and whistles, dragging on the lifeline as long as possible, and then cancelling the cars once they became irrelevant. We saw other examples of that, like the Crossfire, Pacifica SUV, and Aspen, along with the PT Cruiser. As with any Chrysler vehicle during this era, there were various quality control issues with the PT Cruiser that are worth mentioning. Again, these are just some flaws, and they definitely did not kill off the car. The 2.4 liter engine had some issues burning oil, with rough idling, stalling, difficulty starting, and faulty check engine lights. There were common electrical problems as well, where there was trouble with the ignition, dashboard instruments, brake warning lights, radio malfunctions, and failure on some accessories like fog lights and power windows and door locks. There was also plenty of mechanical and safety recalls that you can find on screen, like faulty ball joints, incorrect positioning of a power steering hose, anti-lock brake issues, detaching glass windows, and turn signal problems. The final thing to talk about is the poor safety rating of the PT Cruiser. In 2002, the European New Car Assessment Program gave it a 3 out of 5 stars, and it got just 6 out of 16 points for the frontal impact test. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety in the US didn't test the PT Cruiser until 2008 for the 2009 models, but they did give it very low marks for side and rear impact tests. It was actually ranked as the least safe car out of all the 21 small cars tested that year, and it was the only small car to not offer electronic stability control, leading the IIHS to issue a warning telling the public about this matter. Not too many people cared though, as there was already a million sold by that time, but I did find this very interesting. So that's the end of this video guys. How do you guys feel about the Chrysler PT Cruiser? Do you love it? Do you hate it? And did you ever own one of these? Let me know down in the comment section below. As always, thanks for watching, make sure to like and subscribe for all your Mopar content, and I'll see you in the next video.